James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. in here turn this on and it, it went green and then it went red I thought maybe the battery was going but that's not the case now it's green all right can you hear me <laughs> good it's good to see y'all are we going to have a slide presentation yeah we will so it's been about 11 years I think since uh, I've been with you but uh, it's good to be back and good to see everyone good to see the Apparently, the, the good spiritual health of the congregation here with the number of people that we have present. We're so thankful uh, for you, and uh, we've always enjoyed coming uh, to this part of the country. Uh, this is home for us, uh, having been born and raised in Zanesville, Ohio, and uh, so that's not too far from here. And uh, we're very thankful for every moment that we have to be with you. We're studying this week from the book of James, the epistle of James. This series was actually, I was commissioned by the Warfield Boulevard Church of Christ in Clarksville, Tennessee to do this series. And I'm thankful to them uh, for the opportunity that it uh, presented to me. I never studied James the way that we're studying it uh, this week. What we are doing is we are putting this epistle in its historical context. Without doing that, I don't think we really have a firm grasp of what James was teaching uh, here. And, uh, but by putting it in its historical context, noticing who it is written to, why it was written, uh, it's particularly written to Jewish Christians. This was written uh, before there were any Gentile Christians. Um, and uh, so as such, he is addressing, as I've studied this and went through it, he is addressing cultural uh, traits of the Jewish people that they have had for centuries and centuries. This is the way we are. This is the way we have, this is our culture and so forth. Well, there are some things about their culture that did not fit with being a Christian, and that's what James is addressing. And I hope that we'll be able to bring those things out as we go through uh, this week. Uh, this morning, we're looking at properly handling trials. It's one of the first things that James addresses here. You'll notice it says, uh, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. These are Christians who have come from all over the Roman Empire to Jerusalem to observe Pentecost as they have always done, but this particular Pentecost, the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. 3,000 of them obey the gospel. They're baptized for the remission of their sins. Acts chapter 2 goes on to say they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine in fact they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine in jerusalem up until acts chapter 8 when a great persecution arose against the church at the stoning of stephen and they were scattered abroad and went everywhere preaching the word they just went home they went home they're no longer sitting at the apostles' feet. The apostles remain in Jerusalem. But they have learned enough now that they can 
go out and go, go to their homes, and there will, there will be, uh, this of course continued uh, in the period of uh, miraculous gifts and so forth, and so there were then teachers who had the ability, there would have been knowledge that was miraculously given, so they were well equipped to go and do these things, but as they go and they preach the gospel for which they were persecuted and driven out of Jerusalem, they're going to face some persecutions and some various trials. He says, whether uh, or not James has the trials of persecution in mind, or how a Christian is to face the general trials of life, Christians are to count it all joy when you fall into various trials. That gets your attention, doesn't it? My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. How many letters have you started out that way, focused on the trials of life? <laughs> you're writing to someone, and, and I mean, usually I say, I trust you're doing well, and you know, hope you're, everything's good. And count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why would you start a letter that way? Unless they were going through many various trials. James was aware of that. They were aware of it. Now, how many of us count it all joy when we fall into various trials? We usually don't, do we? We usually look at tri the trials of life as, as something to be concerned about, and they weigh us down. And we talk today, you know, stress is the big word today. Uh, we're stressed by our trials and so forth. This is a very diff different approach to trials than the way the world approaches trials. It's also a very different approach to trials than the way the Jewish culture approached trials. Did you ever see the movie Fiddler on the Roof? Anybody? I'm the only one. My wife saw it. A couple of you. Okay. If you've ever seen <coughs> any movies that deal with Jewish culture and different trials that they're going through, you know, they're all the time... Uh, God, why does it have to be like this? Woe is me. Think back to the Jews as they left Egypt and crossed the Red Sea. Think how happy they were when they got across the Red Sea and everything was great. Their, you know, the Egyptian army was destroyed in the Red Sea and so forth and uh, everything was great. Is that the way you remember it? Is that the way you read it? How long was it before they started mumbling and complaining? We don't have anything to eat. We don't have anything to drink. You know, at least we might have been slaves back there in Egypt, but how'd they feel about being slaves? Were they happy about that when they were back? No. But now they said, we'd rather be slaves than be out here and, and die in the wilderness. And so the Jewish people, the Jewish culture was, was a culture of complainers. It's like they had professional complainers. And they were always, I mean, you were raised in that atmosphere. Can, just think about it. You know, this is your culture. It has been your, it was your parents are that way, your grandparents are that way, your great-grandparents, all the way back. <laughs> They've always complained. That's just, that's just the way we are. And so when James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, I, James, what are you talking about? This is a different way of approaching trials. But it is the right way to approach trials. Why should I be happy, be joyful as I face these trials? Well, he goes on to explain. The New Testament does not teach that Christians will be free of difficulties and trials. It teaches how to face these difficulties and trials from the per perspective 
of and in the character of godliness. This is a this is an, I'm getting an eye examination here this week. Uh, I didn't realize I was going to have to be doing it. I, I'm used to reading it right here. But that's okay. We'll get through this. I know what's in here. I just don't know exactly word for word what's in here, even though I wrote it. Uh, but we fall into various trials. We, we face these things from a different perspective than the world faces them. There are those, of course, in our culture today who preach a gospel, uh, a false gospel, I might say, of health and wealth, that if you become a Christian, that you're going to be healthy and you're going to be happy and you're going to be uh, rich, maybe not rich, but at least you'll have everything that you have need of and all of those kinds of things. The New Testament doesn't teach that. Jesus never taught that. James is certainly saying that's not the case. James is saying... Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. The joy of Christian is not dependent upon outward circumstances and conditions. There's a joy that continues even in the most trying of circumstances. Any Buc Buckeye fans here? I'm one. One very happy last night. Still trying to get over that. But I will, but I'm glad that I'm a Buckeye. I still say the best team on the field last night was the Buckeyes. Count it all joy. You're going to have circumstances, things aren't going to go the way that you want them to go, but you, you are a Christian. You are a follower of Christ. You have have your, had your sins forgiven. You live with a valid hope of eternal life. You know, when somebody asks you a question, are you, are you saved? You, you don't have to answer it with the, well, I hope so, in an empty sort of thing. No, it's a, a valid hope. You have a reason for the hope that is within you. It's the word of God, the verified word of God, the promise of God, and the character of God, that God is faithful, he is trustworthy. And God says, this is what I've done for you, and if you do this, this is what will happen. And if you're living that way, then your, your hope is valid, and you can express it with joy. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns and praised God when they were in a prison in Philippi. The apostles rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for the shame of his name in Acts chapter 5 and verse 41 as they were released from the Sanhedrin council. They were beaten and told not to teach or speak in the name of Jesus anymore. They counted it all joy because Jesus said, count it joy when they persecute you. Rejoice when they persecute you. They had learned that and they were practicing that. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. James says that there are three things about trials that will help prepare our minds for the divine purpose behind trials. And the first one is that trials are certain to come to a Christian. Count it all joy when you fall into various... It doesn't say if you fall into a trial once in a while. He says... You're going to fall into trials. And when you do, be joyful. Acts chapter 14 and verse 22, it says, Strengthen the souls of the disciples, as, as Paul and Barnabas were returning through uh, Iconium and those uh, cities that had uh, driven them out of uh, their city because they were preaching. But they had converted people there, and so they went back through those cities and they said to them, uh, they exhorted them, warned them, and encouraged them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter into the kingdom of God. We're going to have persecutions. We're going to have trials. We're going to have financial problems. We're going to have health problems. We're going to have family problems. Because sometimes people say, well, why is that? Why does God subject us to 
these trials? Why, why do we go through these things? You know, the short answer to that is we're not in the Garden of Eden anymore. They didn't have those trials in the Garden of Eden. They didn't have the troubles in the Garden of Eden. But we're not in the Garden of Eden anymore. We're in the jungle. And we need to realize that things happen in the jungle. It's a dangerous place. But we're not alone. When we face the trials of life, we're not facing them like the world faces them all on their own. We're facing them with Almighty God behind us and his promises and his faithfulness. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12 says, Yes, all who will desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Have you suffered persecution? Has anybody said, I'm not going to be your friend if you're going to be a Christian. I'm not going to be your boyfriend. I'm not going to be your girlfriend if you're going to be a Christian. You ever experienced that? Some of us have. It's not, you know, everybody wants to have friends and wants to be accepted by people, but not everybody's going to accept you. And, and if, if everybody's accepted you, then there's a pretty good chance Christ didn't. Jesus isn't pleased if we're not standing up and being counted. If we're taking the light of truth and the gospel and salvation and we're hiding it under a bushel, Jesus isn't pleased with us. I learned a long time ago that you're not going to please everybody. Regardless of what you do, somebody's going to be upset with you. So you might as well do the right thing. <laughs> because the one person you don't want upset with you is Almighty God. We are not to desire trials and problems and the things that we face. We're not to desire these things, but we are certain to fall into them. We are certain to encounter trials in our lives. We are not to create our hardships, but we are to accept them. Nobody asks to get sick, but you get sick. Nobody asks for financial ruin, but sometimes it happens. We face various trials. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 32 and 39, he says, Recall the former days in which you were illuminated. You endured a great struggle uh, through with sufferings. So in the early days of your conversion, just after you were converted, remember your joy, but also remember it didn't take long until various trials started coming. You started struggling and various sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproach and by tribulations, and partly while you became companions with those who were so treated. That's just part of being a Christian, he said. Remember those days, but remember that you remain faithful. For you had com compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods. They sent to Paul and supported him. He said, I kind of plundered your goods. But you joyfully accepted that, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. So also as we face any trial or any tribulation, let us face it with joy, knowing that we have a better life waiting us in eternity in the presence of God in the heavenly host. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 14 to 15 says, you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things, 
for, from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have been persecuted and they do not please God uh, and are contrary to all men. I'm just about ready to jump out there to where I can, but at least I've got my face toward you th this way. I, I was telling Rick, I said, when I first started doing PowerPoint, it was at Fredericktown, and we just, everything was up here, and it was like on this wall back here, and I could, I could stand off to the side and read it with you and not have my back turned to you, but if I look up here, I've got my back turned to you. Maybe if I come over here, maybe this will work. Let me try this. Maybe this will be more, more. Anyway, let's get back on the lesson. You suffered the same thing from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans. Now, he's writing to the Thessalonians, okay? And he says, you brethren, when you got to Thessalonica, you suffered persecution just as your brethren did in Judea. You see, it Wherever you go with this gospel, there's going to be people who believe you, and there's going to people, be people who reject you, and they're not just going to reject you. They're going to try to get rid of you. You've experienced that. It's, it's part of it, and it's part of it even today. You'll experience that today. It's always been that way. He says they killed both the Lord Jesus Christ and their own prophets. Jesus says... When he sent the apostles out, he says, some of them are going to believe you. Some of them aren't going to believe you because some of them don't believe me. Do it for the sake of the ones who believe. Let your light shine for the sake of the ones who believe. And hopefully even those who don't believe will become believers. Revelation 2 and verse 10, he says, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death and I will give you a crown of life. Jesus to the church at Smyrna said, look, some of you are going to be cast into prison. Be faithful even if it's going to mean your life. Even if they're going to kill you, I've got a crown of life for you. You be faithful. You stand up. We talked this morning about how Domitian would come along and introduce emperor worship. He claimed himself to be God, and the time in which Revelation was written was that time when Christians would not say that Domitian was God, and they would be put into prison, or they would be excommunicated. Some of them would be put to death. Jesus said, you be faithful, regardless of what tribulation you experience. Another thing we see that James shows us here about trials is that trials are various. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Not all of their trials were persecution. It might have been what caused them to be scattered, but there are various different kinds of trials. There are several kinds of Trials considered by James in this epistle. There are financial reversals that we'll talk about in chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. There's oppression from the rich and the powerful that we'll t talks about in chapter 2 and verses 6 through 7. Chapter 5, verses 4 and 6. Uh, suffering, chapter 5 and verse 16. Sickness, chapter 5 and verse 14. Martyrdom, chapter 5 and verse 6. Various trials. Whatever the trial is, face it in joy. Face it like Paul and Silas in that uh, Philippian prison. Trials test our strength and test and strengthen our faith. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. The word patience there comes from a Greek word that means endurance. It makes you stronger. The testing of your faith makes you stronger. It's just like with the physical body. If you want to get stronger, uh, you say, well, I want, to, I want to pick up a 50 pound weight. And you struggle to pick it up. Maybe you can't pick it up. 
Well, what do you do? You start picking up a lighter weight several times. Pick it up, put it down, pick it up, put it down. It's real boring, but this, that's what you do to get stronger. And then as you're able to do it with that light weight, say 25 times or whatever, you pick up a, strong, a heavier weight. And you start increasing the repetitions, you get stronger. And what, how do you get stronger? Well, your muscles get sore. You know that soreness of your muscle? Uh, that's not pleasant, is it? But what's happening there physically is that actually when you're doing that exercise, you're tearing muscle. You're ripping your muscles. But then as they go through the process of repairing themselves, not only do they repair the rip, they add additional muscle material there. And so you get stronger because you're testing it, and eventually you're able to pick up that 50-pound weight. You ever pick up a, and curl a 50-pound dumbbell? It's not easy to do. <laughs> and most people aren't able to do it the first time they do it. But you can do it if you'll go through the training of it. The testing of your faith produces patience or endurance. Trials test our faith and produce patience which develops character. And so, so we've got formatting problems here because of different, I used to think it was computers, but it's not computers. It's the Word Perfect program, or it's the PowerPoint program that you're using. Uh, so, I don't know. We might have to do some previewing of some things here to get this worked out. I think we'll be okay for this lesson, but some of them get messed up. But anyway, as you go through your various trials with joy, you'll see that the next trial that you endure, you're able to endure even a stronger trial. <laughs> Wait a minute, I, I don't want to endure any stronger trials. But that's life. Satan doesn't quit. God will not allow us to be tested above what we are able to bear, but will with the temptation and test also make a way of escape. God knows what we're capable of enduring. Why does he want us to endure it? Because it glorifies him. It shows that we're trusting him. And so you think about Job in that story, that in one day, everything that he had was gone. All of his wealth, his children, all of his animals, all of his servants, they're all gone. God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? What was he saying? Job will be faithful to me, regardless of what you do to him, Satan. And Satan said, well, it's just because you didn't let me touch his health. God said, okay, but you can't kill him. And he remained faithful. Remember, Job said, though he slay me, I will not deny him. You know, the, the thing that really impresses me about the story of Job is that Job is probably the oldest of the scriptures that we have. It was the first that was written. And what does that tell us? It tells us that we know a whole lot more than Job did. God's revealed a whole lot more to us about trials and about life and everything than Job knew. Job and his friends, remember his friends came to him and said, Job, the reason this is happening to you is because you sinned. You need to repent of your sin and confess it. And Job searched his soul and said, if I've sinned, I don't know what it is. I don't know why this is happening. He tried to reason with God. God, why are you doing this to me? But yet the bottom line was, if he, if he even kills me, I, I'm not going to deny him. God knew that about Job. Have you considered my servant Job? Job will honor me. Job will remain faithful to me. Job, trust me. 
and I'm going to take care of Job. And he did take care of Job. Did Job's strength get stronger because of that test? Yeah. He still had questions at the end of it, but his strength got stronger. And ours does too when we face our various trials. Let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Don't give up, don't quit, keep going. Don't lack anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives you liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. And right here we start to think, wow, we are changing the subject now. Why are we talking about wisdom when we were talking about trials? He's not changing the subject. He's saying in order for you to endure your trial, you have to have wisdom you have to have a knowledge of how to face that trial and to be joyful in faith in facing it ask god who gives the gives you liberally without reproach and it will be given to him wisdom is revealed by god proverbs 2 and verses 1 through 11 says my son if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and you lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear or the reverence of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Does this have a... It doesn't have a... doesn't have a laser pointer on it, does it? Okay. What? That's all right. That's okay. But I just want you to notice, he says, you will understand the reverence of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God when? If you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, you incline your heart to wisdom. Where's that wisdom found? It's in the word of God. If you do that, he says, then you will know. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand the righteousness of it and justice, equity, and every good path. When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to you, your soul, your soul, discretion will preserve you. And something else is underneath that. But the point is that where does wisdom come from? It comes from God. How do you get it? Do you pray for wisdom and you get it? No. Well, he says pray for wisdom. But wisdom doesn't come supernaturally. You are not supernaturally endowed with wisdom. Pray to God, ask to God, and it will be given to you. But realize that in order for God to give it to you, you have to go to his word. You have to go to his instruction. That's where his wisdom is revealed to us. And we need to continue in that wisdom. Daniel 2 and verse 21. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding understanding of what you have to understand his word do we understand it the first time usually not but pray for understanding seek knock ask and it will be given to you it will be open to you but no realize that we need to ask god let him ask god who gives liberally and without reproach let him ask in faith Trusting, without doubting, with no doubting. He says, how much doubting is that? Zero. If you ask God for something, don't ask saying, well, he might do that. Ask believing, and it will be given. If you pray in agreement with his revealed will, You will have what you ask. 
That's a promise from God. With no doubting. Verse 9 goes on to say, Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation. Let him glory in his humiliation, that he's been made humbled by his place before God. Because as the flower of the field, he will pass away. He realizes, okay, I'm rich, I've got a lot of stuff, and I'm looked up to in the community because I'm rich and, and that type of thing. But you know, this stuff doesn't last forever. I'm not going to be here forever. Solomon went through all of that. He says, you know, I built up all this wealth and all these things, and they mean something to me, but they don't mean nothing to the generation that's coming after me. What's going to happen to these things? And so really, the things that we look at and we think that somebody's important because they possess this or have this or have so much money or whatever it might be, it really doesn't mean anything. And the Christian who comes, the rich Christian who comes to that realization glories in the fact that he's been humbled by that realization. No sooner has the sun risen with a burning of the heat and it withers the grass and the flower falls and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Nothing wrong with being rich. Nothing wrong with pursuing those things. But do so to the glory of God, not to the advancement of yourself. Trials develop a new dignity in Christ. That's what he's saying. The, the low brother rejoices that he's been raised up in Christ. And the rich has, rejoices that he's been humbled and he realizes that things is not what life is all about. The wisdom that is from above has taught us that it is impossible to serve two masters. Like the double-minded person of, of verse 8. Can't serve God and mammon and money can't, you need to make up your mind which one you're going to serve. The rich have learned that they cannot trust in their riches. They must thank God for them and use them for his glory rather than their own glory. First Timothy 6 and verses 17 and 18, Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty nor to trust in uncertain riches but to trust in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. God gives us richly all things to enjoy. Enjoy what you have. Enjoy your money. Enjoy the things that you've purchased with your money. Enjoy those things, but don't make those things your God. Don't make those things your idol. Don't serve those things. Don't live for them. And realize that God has blessed you to be a blessing to others. Share what you have with others. He's going to get into that later in the epistle. Trials may be such for the rich that they experience a financial reversal. And their riches fade away. However, they long ago cease to glory in their wealth. They have learned to put all of their trust in God. Things happen. Financial ruin happens. Doesn't take much to wipe out everything that we've got. We learn to put our trust in God. Verse 12 goes on to say, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away of his own desires and enticed. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Now, both the word trials in verse 2 up there, count all joy when you fall into various trials, and temptation in verse 12, they are both the same Greek word. Their meaning is not inherent in the word. 
their, word, their meaning is found in the context in which they are used. And so the various trials are various things that happen to us in life. The temptations that we fall into, that, that we endure, are things that we have put ourselves into. We bring these things upon ourselves. As used in verse 2, trials are things which happen to fall into for no choice of our own. They test our faith. Their intention is to make us stronger and to develop our character. But in used in verse 12 and verse 13, temptation is that which we have brought on ourselves. Each one is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. God has not, will not, and cannot lead us into temptation. God hates evil. He doesn't have anything to do with it. Unlike trials, verse 2, we do not fall into temptation. Rather, each of us is drawn away by our own desires and enticed, as it says here in verse 14. You've got your things that you're drawn away by, things that you want to think about various sins. Think about, I might want to do that. Don't be drawn away by your own desires. Don't be enticed by your own desires. The character of godliness will abstain from the conception of sin, will not be drawn away when he realizes being enticed to sin, will shut it down right there. The character of godliness will abstain from conception of sin, abort it, and not allow it to separate himself from God. The wages of sin is death. When we sin, we separate ourselves from God. God doesn't want to be separated from us. We don't want to be separated from him. Shut your sin down. When you're enticed through the temptation of sin, shut it down, say no. Start thinking on good things. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. James has some things to say to these people that have been dispersed. He's going to show them as they are. It's going to be difficult for them to receive them. But he says, you're my brethren and I love you. You need to see these things because you need to let Christ be seen in you. And unless you get, way, get rid of this character that you have now to develop the character of Christ... We're not fulfilling what God created us to be. Remember, God told the, the nation of Israel, and he tells us, Peter will bring this out. He says, you be holy because I am holy. God, we are created in the image of God. God is holy, and he created us to be holy. God is pure. He created us to be pure. God is love. He created us to be love. Others focus, not self focus. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation of shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Every good gift, every perfect bit gift is from above. Trials, tribulations, temptations. That doesn't come from God. Those things come from Satan. We need to realize that he is out to destroy us. Every good thing, every perfect thing 
comes from above. He brought us forth by the word of truth. You want wisdom? So he hasn't left that. He hasn't left that. He said, this is how you deal with trials. Understand, God is giving us a look behind the curtain here. God is saying, look, this is how it is. If you want to endure trials with joy, then realize that you can and that these things are going to make you stronger. If you're going to overcome the temptations that test you and appeal to your carnal desires, then understand that you can say no to them. That's what he's teaching us here. He brought us forth by the word of truth, and he keeps us by the word of truth as well. My beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. Be anxious to hear God's word. Be slow to speak. Don't speak back to God. Yeah, but don't question God. Be slow to wrath. Don't get angry with God. The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. He has not left the subject of wisdom. Realize, go to the word of God. and Pray for understanding. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Okay. Bear with me right here. This is the end of it. I'm going to give you an example. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Here's a trial that the Apostle Paul fell into. He had a thorn in the flesh. And he didn't know how to deal with it. He asked God to remove it from him. Lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. It didn't come from God. Every good and perfect thing comes from God. But thorns in the flesh, and if you want to debate that, I'll leave and you all can discuss it if you want to. But it's a trial. Probably something in his health. He thought it was holding him back from being able to be impressive in presenting the word of God or living as a Christian. He was wrong about that. A thorn in the flesh was given to me. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord that three times that it might depart from me. Why three times? Do you ever think about that? How many times did Jesus go to God in prayer in the night before he was crucified? Three times. There's a significance to that. His answer was, my grace is sufficient for you. And you know, God could have put a period right there. Paul, you remember who you were? Remember you were persecuting Christians? You were putting people in prison? You were separating families? You were putting people to death? And you were taught the gospel and you obeyed it and your sins were washed away. And I said, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. And you did that. Isn't that enough? So what if you have a thorn in the flesh? God could have stopped right there, couldn't he? My grace is sufficient for you. But he didn't. He went on and explained. He went on and explained. My strength is made perfect in weakness. What you need to understand, Paul, is that the faith that is living in you and your faithfulness in spite of this thorn in the flesh is showing how strong your faithfulness is and that faithfulness came from me, came from my word. You are remaining faithful. Your brethren are experiencing the same persecution, the same various trials that you are experiencing and you are remaining faithful, and you, they see you remaining faithful, and they say, if Paul can do it, I can do it. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Yeah, there's a weakness there, but what I see even greater is the strength of your faith and you remaining faithful. 
So Paul said, therefore I will gladly boast in my infirmities, knowing that the power of Christ rests upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Various trials. Various trials. He says, I'm going to remain faithful. Because when I am weak, then I am made strong. And but the strength that is seen is not my strength. The strength that is seen is the strength of God living in me. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. We don't know how to do that unless God teaches us and he has taught us. I'm thankful for his word. I'm thankful for the opportunity that we've had this morning to, to talk about these things. I'm thankful for the week that's before us and the things that we're going to learn and be reminded of this week. I believe our faith is going to grow stronger, but maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian. You know, all spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus. The question is, are you in Christ Jesus? How do you get into Christ Jesus? We're baptized into Christ. Baptized for the remission of our sins, for the taking away of our sins. But before we do that, we have to make a decision to turn away from our sins. To stop living for ourselves and start living to the honor and the glory of God. Maybe you've come to that point in your life. Maybe you realize that you need to be living for Christ instead of gratifying the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You need to turn away from that. And rather than face the trials of life alone without any hope, you can face the trials of life with joy because Christ is at your side. I know that's where I would rather be. I believe that's where you would rather be. And if you're subject to the invitation today in any way, we'd encourage you to come as we stand and sing the song that's been selected.